Good evening, one and all. Welcome to one more webinar at Believers Church Medical College and Hospital. We welcome all doctors, medical students, dignitaries from around the globe, especially our guests from Karlstad University, Sweden, Varki sir from South Africa, and all of the doctors from Kerala and beyond. Today, we have in our midst an unprecedented pandemic. And we are all absolutely flabbergasted as to what is gonna happen next. So just to put things in perspective and to throw some more light on the medical management, we have with us Dr. Avinash Alexander, who is currently a hospitalist at the Hendrick Regional Medical Center in Abilene, Texas, USA. After graduating as the magna cum laude at the Texas Tech University, he went on to complete his MD from the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in Lubbock, during which he was awarded the best PG resident for the year 2017-18. He's American board certified in internal medicine and won the Gold Humanism Award in 2017 from the Gold Humanism Honor Society, GHHS. He has been through three years of intense internal medicine rotation during his IM residency and has the program director comment that he was probably the best PG resident in the years. A star, he was called. He's specially skilled in ICU management of critically ill patients and has a good exposure in treating COVID patients too. Avinash, it's a great privilege to have you in our midst. Incidentally, he's also the brother, younger brother of our illustrious radiologist, Dr. Ashwin Varghese Alexander. And today, our illustrious moderator is none other than distinguished faculty and senior professor of medicine, Dr. S.K. Matthew, sir. He's currently the chief of unit two in the Department of General Medicine at BCMCH and also is the head of infectious diseases. After completing his MBBS from Garment TD Medical College, Alipi, he went on to do his MD General Medicine from the prestigious Garment Kielpok Medical College in Chennai. He served for five years in the Tamil Nadu Health Services, after which he worked in esteemed institutions, namely Kielpok Medical College, Madras Medical College, and Kanyakumari Medical College, Nagar Koyal, where he retired as Dean and Professor and Head of General Medicine. He has worked as senior consultant at the Alwaha Group Clinics in Dubai and was professor of medicine and unit chief at Dr. SM CSI Medical College near Trivandrum. Hailed by his students as an excellent teacher and colleagues as an astute administrator and brilliant and compassionate clinician. Sir, it's a great privilege to have you today with us as moderator. His Lifetime Achievement Award from MGR Medical University resonates across the state and beyond. Over to you, sir, for the moderation. SK Matthew, sir. Well, thank you, Jacob, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you. 
and uh, welcome Dr. Avinash, Avinash Alexander, welcome. And uh, this is your session, a session on uh, COVID-19 and its uh, uh, current therapies. But as an introduction, I would like to say that uh, as we go into the uh, seventh or eighth month of this pandemic, we see a catastrophic increase in the uh, cases, in cases. India has crossed uh, 55 lakhs now, and there is also an alarming increase in number of mortalities. And what uh, the thing which is uh, which followed the pandemic, especially uh, for the uh, for the medical fraternity, was an avalanche of uh, academics that every day we see a lot of webinars and there are thousands of scientific papers published within uh, a couple of months or three or four months. So what I want to insist on this point is that uh, we should realize that uh, most of these paper, uh, these webinars come from the experience of uh, the treating physicians who actually risk their lives and cared for the COVID people, uh, the patients, and also documented all these uh, policies and protocols and strategies. So we should respect and value these uh, webinars and talks and try to adopt whatever is feasible and uh, good for our practice and for our patients. We also uh, should, when it comes to the actual uh, treatment arena, when it comes to uh, confronting a, a, um, a patient who is uh, sick and uh, and, with and with complications, of course, uh, there is an element of apprehension and doubt. And as you all know, now we are dealing with a virus which is novel and unprecedentedly lethal. Now over to you, Dr. Avinash Alexander, and uh, uh, I'm sure that he is a true COVID care physician who has tremendous experience in managing uh, complicated cases, and we look for uh, look forward for your talk. Over to Dr. Avinash Alexander. Hello, can everyone hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, th thanks, Dr. Matthew, for the introduction. And Dr. Jacob, you're a very talented promoter. I need to take you everywhere I go to make sure we give a amazing introduction. Very, very talented, and thank you for that. Um, see, so yeah, we we each have unique experiences as far as COVID goes. Um, one thing I think the pandemic has taught us overall is that there's limits to how much, um, you know, there's limits to how much information we have out there, especially something when something new is concerned. And the best we can do is with what evidence we have, what's evidence based. Um, to practice it um, to, to, the, to something where we can maximally do good and minimally do harm, just like with anything else. And what's tough about COVID is that because it's a new thing, a lot of emerging literature is out there um, on what's good, uh, what's interesting, uh, what's promising, but we have to be in a cautious state where we, um, when we choose to do therapeutics, uh, because sometimes it can do harm and we just don't know it much, much later, until much, much later. But anyway, um, one thing, one basic concept you have to understand is, is that it is a virus just like anything else. And um, 
more than any medicine we can give, we have to believe in people's immunity uh, and their immune system to fight this rather than therapeutics. But that being said, um, we can go over a little bit of an overview on what we know about the virus and what has been proven to somewhat work and somewhat be effective. So I have a PowerPoint slide that I'm trying to share with you guys. Uh, one second. Now, can everyone hear me? Okay, is everyone able to see the PowerPoint? If someone wants to unmute their mic and just let me know if they can hear and yes, see sir. it. Yes, sir. Okay, you can see it? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. Um, so uh, this talk is mainly intended for, um, for general clinicians um, and medical students, of course. But it's not, uh, let's say, uh, it doesn't dwell deep into um, pathophysiology and virology. So it's mainly oriented towards clinicians uh, who practice and treat COVID patients. So um, the, the coronavirus, um, officially called um, SARS-CoV-2, that's the name of the virus, um, causes the disease we call COVID-19. And we know this virus is genetically similar to um, the SARS, MERS, uh, the SARS and the MERS virus. We know that because um, they are um, they're extracted to virus that are similarly recovered from bats. And that's why we assume at this point that the likely vector is from bats. One second. You can say play from current slide. One second. Uh, Maybe you can. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Are you able to see it now? Yes. Okay. Your video. Okay. Your video. Uh, one second. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. So um, they are genetically similar to the viruses recovered from bats, and um, these bat coronaviruses they use these human receptors for cell entry. So that's how we know. Uh, again, bats are the likely source based on prior um, evidence from um, SARS and the MERS virus. And um, initially, the virus was found in Wuhan uh, province in China. And the initial vi viral RNA analysis, it showed that it had 96% match to the uh, bat SARS-like virus. Uh, there's also um, evidence that it did not come directly from bats to humans and that there's an intermediate host. Um, in the case of SARS virus, uh, that can, the, the original SARS virus, that can be from civets um, or um, raccoon dogs that are sold in wet markets. In the case of MERS, the Middle Eastern respiratory virus, um, it came from domesticated camels. Um, right now, there's not a definite source on what the intermediate host um, for COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV-2 can be. Um, this is what the virus looks like, just a generic structure. Um, what I want people to understand is that it's made up of a positive uh, single-stranded mRNA. 
and it has all these envelope proteins um, seen in here in different colors, green. Um, but the main promising protein that it has is the spike glycoprotein, um, these big red projections outside of the cell, outside of the viral um, envelope, I mean. Um, that's what gives it its characteristic name um, because it looks like a crown. That's hence why it's called coronaviruses because of its this distinct nature. Um, this is a kind of a busy slide, but what we want to do is focus in on a few things, uh, uh, starting from the top left side. So this is what, again, the coronavirus looks like. And it the way it infects its host, it, ha it has to bind to something on the host cell. And that something is the ACE2 receptor. So the entry of this uh, virus involves two spike proteins it itself has, and they attach to uh, uh, the ACE2 receptor along with, um, along with the help from this green receptor that you see, which is a serine protease. Um, the long the form is TMPRSS2, but just know it's a protease. It's an enzyme that um, helps with cleavage and viral entry into the cell. Then after it binds, there's uncoding and essentially there's release of the viral positive stranded RNA into our cells. And um, the, the virus really uses our host ribosomes to, uh, to encode its DNA and makes these polyproteins. Here you see PP, PP1A and PP1AB. Um, so then, it in, then this RTC complex is involved, replication transcription uh, complex. And it drives the synthesis of negative stranded um, RNAs. And along with that, it also makes these subgenomic structural proteins, which also are involved um, in repackaging the virus. After all this is said and done, the viral RNA, along with the proteins it made from using our cellular uh, mechanisms, are packaged into this nucleocapsid, creates an envelope, and then it is released outside the cell. Um, you can go a lot more into its de uh, into the detail of uh, this mechanism if you want, but this is the basic uh, overview of how the virus infects the cell and reproduces itself. What's important to note about this process is that each step of this process you can target in in a way that you can tailor therapeutics. So, uh, for example the 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 very entry into the cell you can target uh, uh, with things like uh, vaccines and convalescent um, antibodies to prevent entry into the cell you can pr uh, prevent endocytosis with uh, theoretically what they were saying initially was hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine you can prevent viral replication at this step with um, certain drugs, remdesivir being one of them. And so, and so on, in each step of the way, you can tailor certain types of therapeutics that either inhibit the, viral from, the virus from replicating, entering the cell, or, or once it does all that, um, one of the natural responses for our body is to produce these cytokines that create what's called a cytokine storm. Um, so at that point, we can tailor therapeutics that actually mitigate that part of the, um, the, vi the viral life cycle, the cytokine storm. Because sometimes, even though our body means the best, it can, its response to the virus can cause more damage and more disease than the actual virus itself. Okay. So clinical manifestations. Um, well, so the incubation period of the virus is most of the time, 99% of the time, it's within 14 days of exposure. You will have some kind of symptoms. 80% uh, 
of the people actually, though, have symptoms within four to five days after exposure. But 99% of the cases is less than 14 days. Okay. Um, so you can have a wide range of symptoms. You could have, uh, it could, the disease could manifest as pneumonia, which is usually you have fever, cough, chest x ray findings. You could have just upper respiratory symptoms, which is like rhinorrhea, sinusitis, congestion. Um, or what's a little more unique, but not very common um, to COVID-19 is smell and taste dis uh, disorders. Um, this is a little bit different from the other viruses because COVID it's more unique to COVID-19, yet it's not very common in COVID-19, if that makes sense. Um, if you were to break down the, the symptoms of this disease, you have to, if you wanna give percentages on how many people who get this have this, this is what the breakdown looks like. Now, this slide has changed quite a bit from March all the way till now. Uh, when I was looking at this in March, fever actually used to be 99%. And we saw that actually, and we, uh, dated, we put a data point on that because that was the, what the original studies from Wuhan was showing. But as this virus has spread worldwide and as the strain also has mutated quite a bit, um, fever we see is much, much less common than 99%. So about 43% of the cases is what we are seeing has fever. And um, we generally define fever more in the high grade, anything greater than 100.4. 50% uh, have cough. The rest, you know, you have flu-like um, symptoms like body aches, myalgia, headaches, shortness of breath, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Again, going back to um, what I said earlier, what's unique about COVID uh, of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus, is that people tend to also have anosmia, um, loss of smell, agesia, loss of taste, which tends to be more unique towards um, SARS-CoV-2. What's also, um, so it's more unique, yet only less than 10% of the cases have it. What's also interesting is that um, I saw this article two days ago from uh, University of California in San Diego, which reviewed about 169 patients. And the article basically in a nutshell was saying people who have these features, anosmia and agasia, they tend to have more favorable outcomes as far as the disease course is concerned. So out of 120, in that study, out of 128 patients that were studied, um, who had these symptoms, only 26 people were hospitalized. And when they did multivariate regression analysis, um, these two symptoms, anosmia agesia, was independently associated with outpatient care versus inpatient care. Meaning like patients need, um, did not need to be admitted to the hospital if they had this. Um, so, in general, again, flu-like symptoms, uh, but what's unique about this virus is that people also have anosmia agesia. Okay. What about um, on the opposite end? What's, what are predictors of death? Uh, the data that I got as far as predictors of death is from this study by Zhu et al. And of course, what we know, older age is probably the most important comorbidity. So um, this, these numbers, 69 were 32. So 69 um, out of the people who died in the study, 69% uh, of the patients were 65 and older versus 52 being younger than that. Comorbidities play a huge role. And the top three comorbidities listed in not only this study, but in multiple different studies are hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease, coronary artery disease. Um, this was surprising to me even initially when I looked at it because, because uh, the, the um, most obvious manifestation of the virus is it's a respiratory disease. So you would expect someone with a respiratory comorbidity like COPD 
or asthma to be on the top three, but that is not the case. Uh, is it a comorbidity? Of course it is, yes it is, but it doesn't make the top three as these hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease. So that's an important point um, and a surprising point, frankly, for me. Uh, certain lab abnormalities are associated with worse outcomes um, like death, um, lymphopenia, and low platelets. On the other hand, on a CBC, um, leukocytosis, meaning high WBC count, and any marker of coagulopathy or inflammation being high usually is a bad prognosis. So coagulopathy, D-dimer, um, and inflammation, LDH and ferritin. And one thing I should also add to this list is actually CRP. So a high CRP level is also uh, a predictor of mortality. Uh, certain radiographic signs you see more common in people who uh, don't make it. So when you have, when they looked at the studies, people who died, 74% um, of the patients who passed away had pretty significant lung con consolidation versus 53% in, um, in the survival group did. Ground glass opacities were seen in 81 uh, percent of the patient who died versus 67 percent who did well. And then bilateral pulmonary infiltrates were seen in 83 percent versus 72 percent who did well. So these are some of the predictors of doing bad, doing um, of essentially dying from the disease. Um, so the course, you can have anywhere from mild disease, which really is what most people have, even though we see the worst of things on the news. Um, and even in a scientific presentation like this, when we present some of the worst of the cases, majority of the people you have to understand do, do have a mild disease. Um, but you could have, the disease can manifest in quite a bit of different ways. You, the, the list is actually quite never ending because every day, every other day, you can see these articles, neurological complications of COVID, um, psychiatric complications of COVID. But the two that I really wanna focus on this presentation more is the respiratory component and the embolic, thromboembolic complications. Um, I was going to include, include cardiac complications, but we can do that another time. So diagnosis. Um, so at this point in our hospitals, uh, mainly the way we diagnose COVID is through two, two testing. One is PCR and one is antigen testing. Now the PCR test, um, it, it detects genetic material of the virus using uh, PCR. So here, um, Healthcare worker usually collects fluid from a nasal, um, nasopharyngeal specimen or from saliva, and the results is usually available in minutes if your lab has the assay for it. The PCR tests, they tend to be very accurate. Um, the numbers that I'm seeing are like up, for, as far as specificity goes, it's upwards from 98 to 99%. Um, but the sensitivity um, is, uh, about 80%. So what that means is that 20% of the negatives you get might be a false negative. The antigen test um, is much cheaper um, and it's much quicker. So where the, where the PCR might take us a couple of hours, the antigen test takes us about 30 to 45 minutes to get the results. Um, so again, you get a nasopharyngeal specimen, just like the other one. And you know the test within minutes because it detects actual viral antigen. You don't have to go through a replication process like in PCR to, to get the virus. Um, in generally, generally speaking, the, the antigen test less tends to be a, a little less sensitive than the PCR. Um, the numbers may not be that much different, maybe like to a point of 10 to 
but both of them are great tools as far as diagnosis goes. Um, and one, one little um, detail that actually I hear from some of the experts here is that the antigen testing is, is very good when someone is very contagious. So the theory behind that is that when someone has the disease and they're contagious, they tend to have a higher viral load. And in, that, and, and in those cases, the antigen test is much better at detecting the disease. But on the other hand, with the PCR, what happens is that, um, let's say someone gets the disease and they're fighting it off. It's been about three weeks and they're starting to clear the disease and they're no longer considered infectious. The PCR test, if you do it on them, it might still be positive. Um, because, because it's uh, looking at uh, viral DNA, right? So any amount of viral load that the uh, patient might have, the PCR will detect and come back as a positive test. So it's not to say that the patient does not have the virus. It's to say that the, even though the patient is clearing and no longer infective, the PCR test might be positive. That's one thing you should note when you're ordering these tests on people. Um, um, towards the, uh, hello. Yeah, sorry. Uh, towards the, um, flu season, uh, there are some companies that are actually incorporating a combined flu and COVID testing. One, one such is called the flu SC2 multiplex assay. And we probably will be releasing this around November, December season, where we test for influenza A, influenza B, and COVID at the same time, with just one simple swab. So this is thought to be very helpful during the coming months. There's also serologic testing. I don't want to go deep into that because um, there's a lot of inaccuracies associated with it. Right now, as of now, there's about 80 different companies and 80 different serological tests available. Out of that, around 11 or 12 are FDA approved. And out of the ones that are FDA approved, only about, they have a sensitivity of only 30 to 40%. So the numbers are not too great for serologic testing. Um, so it's generally not used in any of our hospitals. Okay. So um, let's go into the two main um, considerations for the disease. One is respiratory component. So um, in a large cohort of patients um, with COVID-19, that um, the studies that um, I've looked at, about 81%, so majority of the people actually have mild disease. 14% had severe disease, 5% usually become critically ill with organ failure. And the once you become critically ill, the mortality is about 49% um, of those patients. The um, majority of critically ill patients also are ventilator dependent and they are ventilator dependent really for a prolonged period of time. So once you're on a ventilator, what that's saying is that the, it takes a while to either come off of it if you ever do. So what do we define by mild and severe? So severe disease, essentially, if you have any of these features, shortness of breath, tachypnea with the respiratory rate greater than 30, a saturation of less than 93% on room air, a PF ratio of less than 300, um, or infiltrates um, that's greater than 50% of the lung fields um, within, within 24 to 48 hours of symptoms. Any of these features happen and you're officially considered it as a severe disease. And again, the numbers show that 14% of people who get COVID have severe disease. Um, clinicians must time intubation properly. What does this mean? Well, um, like I said, it's sometimes a difficult decision to intubate because you want patient to have some kind of 
um, chants before the ventilator, if, before you put them on a ventilator, you want to try uh, putting maximally putting them on oxygen, high flow nasal cannula, and then non-invasive mechanic, non-invasive ventilation like BiPAP, CPAP, etc. So maximally that you can, you want to avoid the ventilator because it's hard to come off of it. That being said, you should not delay intubation indefinitely because um, if you're having to intubate someone on an emergent basis, meaning like you didn't plan ahead and they're suddenly crashing as far as their symptoms goes, that tends to have a lot more risk to you as a healthcare provider and to the patient because when you do things in a rush and hurry, generally you don't have time to properly put on PPE. Um, there tends to be more aerosolization of the virus. So um, risk to patient and yourself is going to be higher when you intubate people uh, much later. Um, some signs that you should that should point towards intubation should be unsustainable breathing, refractory hypoxemia, refractory hypercapnia, um, refractory acidosis, encephalopath encephalopathy, uh, where people are confused from being acidotic, or inadequate airway protection. Now, um, what's important to note about the um, hypercapnia and hypoxia is that you get these measures really multiple ways, most accurate being an ABG, arterial blood gas. And internal medicine physicians especially should um, interpret those ABGs appropriately because just because the numbers look right on an ABG does not necessarily have to translate to the patient. Um, so for example, if the PCO2 is 36 or 38, you can say, oh yeah, it's less than 40, it's okay. But you have to look that in the context of how acidotic the patient is, is he properly compensating? So you use things like the Winters formula to um, assess whether the, the, whether the CO2 levels are appropriate for that patient, uh, not just part of the normal values. Um, so the most severe manifestation of the respiratory issues is patients who get ARDS. Now, um, initially, um, there was there was some um, considerations on how we should manage the ARDS that we get from COVID compared to ARDS from other sources. Um, there was some talk on there's two different types of ARDS, like an L phenotype and an H phenotype, um, but more the most prominent literatures that I've seen so far say that there's not many much um, much clinical differences as far as pathophysiology goes on the type of ARDS COVID patients have. So essentially they're telling us, um, don't worry about the phenotypes of ARDS, just treat COVID um, as if it's any other source of ARDS. So that being said, how do you treat ARDS? Generally um, for the last two decades, the uh, strategy to treat ARDS has been this. So you want to avoid valley, ventilator-associated lung injury by preventing alveolar distension, too much oxygen, and preventing alveolar collapse. Um, the, one of the ways we do it is with a low tidal volume ventilation. Um, when, you, when you put someone on a ventilator, you need to set a tidal volume, and you start out by six cc's per kg of ideal body weight. So you calculate their ideal body weight and do six cc's per kg. Um, a few times each day, the clinicians, what they should do, they should initiate a half second inspiratory pause while someone is on a ventilator. What this allows is that um, it allows a pressure in the airway circuit between the patient and the ventilator to equilibrate and the pressure at the airway circuit at the end of the inspiratory pause, that is known as the plateau pressure. Um, so this approximates the alveolar pressure, the plateau pressure. And generally you want to avoid plateau pressures greater than 30. Again, this is all part of um, the strategy to avoid ventilator associated lung injury. 
um, you have to set a sufficient peep. Now peep, remember, is the positive pressure that you set on a ventilator, the pressure that remains in the airways after someone, um, uh, someone expires, so someone does expiration. Um, PEEP usually prevents alveolar collapse and, and it helps with the recruitment um, of unstable uh, lungs. But too much PEEP can also be bad. Um, so too much PEEP can reduce venous return to the heart, causing hemodynamic inst instability. Um, the other thing uh, too much PEEP can do, it, it can cause one of the two things we're trying to avoid here, alveolar over distension which can reduce lung compliance in general. So um, the question always becomes, what is ideal PEEP? How do you, um, di there's different pulmonologies, the different lung strategies. Um, one of the tables that I found on, uh, on PubMed actually is uh, this chart right here. So when you're starting someone on, um, on a ventilator with these current settings, depending on what FiO2 you set them at, usually you would start out with 100%. Um, you can um, set the PEEP according to this. So if someone, if you're weaning them down and let's say they're on an FiO2 of 50%, 0.5, ideally their PEEP should be about eight to 10. So you can use this table essentially to tailor the PEEP setting uh, based on what FiO2 you have set your patient on, on the ventilator. Another thing that can help with ARDS management is prone positioning. Um, what this means is flipping the patient over on the other side, on their belly. Uh, prone positioning during mechanical inhalation, uh, it helps quite a bit with refractory hypoxemia or severe ARDS, which is defined by a PF ratio less than 150. Um, again, severe disease is PF ratio less than 300. Severe ARDS is PF ratio less than 150. Um, the idea behind prone positioning is that um, the, 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 some of the circulation tends to be gravity dependent, some of the blood circulation towards the lung. So when you change positions, um, certain parts that are under uh, circulated or under ventilated becomes more circulated or more ventilated when you change positions. So that's the idea behind prone positioning or uh, changing positioning in general. And different hospitals have different protocols. Usually um, the ones I've seen commonly in literature is uh, doing prone positioning about 16 hours per day, uh, which improves oxygenation quite a bit. Um, and lastly, you want to avoid hypervolemia when, when you have someone with ARDS. So the general concept of ARDS is that dry lungs are happy lungs because the more wet lungs are, the less compliant they tend to be, the less they participate in ventilation and oxygenation. That being said, you also want to avoid um, hypovolemia because remember part of uh, how the body is composed, you need to have some kind of hemodynamic stability. And for that, you need volume. And keep in mind, you have the potential of losing volume too when, when you are ventilated. Why? Because each breath you take, what you're breathing out is CO2 and H2O and water. So when someone is constantly tachypneic or if they're febrile, you have two ways that you can have insensitive um, water losses, one from just the breathing itself, the other from diaphoresis, from sweating. So these are two ways people can lose volume and that you should be aware too. One thing on a CHEM7, um, on a CMP that you can see is hypernatremia. So if someone is losing volume, you can see their sodium levels going up slowly. And that's one sign that you probably need more free water replacement on this patient. Um, so this, the respiratory issues was one part. There's many other parts. The second part I really want to focus really on, and which is a little unique to COVID-19, uh, is though is the coagulopathy associated with it. Um, so more and more that we have seen, uh, 
we've shown uh, studies have shown that COVID-19 creates a very highly thrombotic state, and they even have a term for it called CAC, COVID-associated coagulopathy. Uh, two of the studies that I saw, uh, the CUE et al. and CLOCK et al., showed that on the first study, they showed that 25% of um, what we call, again, severe COVID cases developed DVTs. And in another study, 31% um, of severe COVID cases developed one of three things, either a DVT, PE, or an arterial thrombi. So clearly these numbers are significant and coagulopathy is a, is a distinguishing feature of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, the D-dimer is actually a very helpful tool in, in assessing coagulopathy and um, figuring out what to do as far as, um, as far as suspicion of coagulopathy goes. Um, what's interesting is that the D-dimer is often elevated, but the other markers of DIC, disseminated intra intravascular coagulation, tends to be unchanged. Things like fibrinogen, platelets, prothrombin time, INR, PTT. So while all, all those tend to be more or less static, if they do change, that actually has a different prognosis. But majority of the time, they tend not to change as much as the D-dimer. And um, what, um, what studies have shown is that at a level greater than one microgram per ml, um, at least on these uh, multivariate regression analysis studies that they've seen, is that this a level greater than one has an 18 times higher risk of death compared to uh, it being less than one. So that adds a prognostic value again, the D-dimer itself um, to someone who has COVID-19. A level greater than three has a sensitivity of about 70% and a specificity about 96% of developing um, venous thromboembolism. That could mean a DVT or a PE. Um, and another study, it showed that uh, the standard DVT prophylaxis we use, which uh, here is uh, Lovenox or enoxaparin 40 milligrams daily, it failed um, in, in certain ICU patients. So out of 109 patients, 29 patients developed DVT while on low molecular weight heparin in the ICU. So what that's showing is that um, the, the, the normal DVT prophylaxis strategy we use in hospitals may not be the ideal one for COVID patients. Um, this coagulopathy that's associated with COVID-19, you can also see um, as a manifestation in organ damage. So when you look at histopathological studies, um, what um, you're seeing is that in the lung itself, there's diffuse alveolar damage, a lot of inflammation, a lot of thrombosis, and a lot of what we call thrombotic microangiopathy of small vessels and capillaries in the lungs. And outside of the lungs, you also see that in any other organ. So when people who died, um, when you do autopsies of their other tissues, like let's say the kidney, you see the same level of thrombosis and damage uh, in those tissues also. Um, so there's um, the hallmark of COVID-19 is profound inflammation, uh, not just thrombosis, but inflammation in general. And from that other slide that I showed towards the, one of the body's responses um, of fighting the virus is this um, inflammatory cytokines, which causes the so-called cytokine storm. So there's two reasons why someone can have thrombosis. One of that reason is the cytokine storm. With that, the IL-6, the IL-1, tumor necrosis factor, and many other cytokines, they participate in inflammation. And um, when you have inflammation, the, um, it alters the natural anticoagulant pathway towards favoring thrombosis. So what it does is it changes essentially the levels of protein C and S and the tissue factor inhibitor, 
uh, promoting thrombosis. So that's one way um, COVID-19 causes thrombosis. The other, if you remember on the previous slide, how um, the virus binds to the ACE2 receptors on a cell to, um, to enter the cell and to infect the host cell. The same ACE2 receptors are also on endothelial cells, um, cells that line blood vessels. So when the endothelial cells are um, affected by COVID-19, they itself are inflamed, they get thromb and that promotes thrombosis directly. So these are two ways. One, our bodies respond to itself, the cytokine storm, altering the anticoagulant pathway towards thrombosis. The second, it's the virus directly itself causing um, damage to our endothelial cells. So both these um, promote coagulopathy. Now, as far as that, what, what to do about it? Well, um, as far as anticoagulation goes, heparin seems to be the best choice so far as um, to, to uh, treat anticoagulation or to prevent clots. Um, first of all, it is an anticoagulant by definition. So that itself um, is part of the treatment. But one surprising thing that other people might not be, or other surprising things that people aren't very familiar with is that besides its anticoagulant effect, it also has um, somewhat of an anti-inflammatory effect. So um, some of the cytokines involved in cytokine storm, it can be mitigated with heparin itself. And on top of that, there's some question whether it also has antiviral effect. In vitro, studies show that it actually uh, prevents, um, um, it actually uh, blocks the viral entry into the cell by binding to some of the spike glycoproteins, the, those um, corona-shaped proteins on the cell. But um, in vivo studies have um, failed to show this effect that they've seen in in vitro. So that's a question right there. So either way, um, there's multiple reasons to promote heparin or low molecular weight heparin as the choice of anticoagulation versus other. Um, so that being said, if someone, if COVID-19 is a highly thrombotic state and um, people tend to do bad with coagulopathy, why not use full dose anticoagulation for everyone? Why just use DVT prophylaxis dosing? And the answer is really simple complications, bleeding. Um, initially, when this liter when we knew that COVID-19 was a highly coagulopathic state, this was around uh, March, April time, uh, physicians here were a lot more ad, um, advocating using heparin drips, full dose heparin drips on patients who had COVID, who were hospitalized. But this kind of strategy, what essentially does is that it reduce it increases bleeding risks for a lot of people who may uh, may not get um, any kind of blood clots. Um, and he, I was actually reading a story yesterday on a 28 year old um, OBGYN resident who actually passed away from COVID. And let me see if I can pull that up really quick. So um, this is a 28-year-old um, Houston doctor. She's an OB-GYN resident, actually, uh, second year. So she died of COVID after about a month and a half of battling it. One of the, um, one of the um, points that actually that I found interested was that um, on the article, it said a CT scan revealed massive amounts of damage caused by a brain bleed and a medical team was looking for permission to perform a procedure to relieve the pressure. So what this, it's possible that the COVID itself could have done it, but more likely um, it's possible that the anticoagulation we gave probably caused the brain bleed in this, um, in this doctor, in this patient. Um, 
so, so what that tells us essentially is that we cannot anticoagulate everyone. Um, so what is the right strategy then? Clearly COVID is a highly thrombotic state, anticoagulation benefits in certain people. So how do we, anti how do we choose who to anticoagulate? Well, the strategy that I've seen that's best adopted is in Cleveland Clinic. And this is the strategy I use personally. And I actually, a lot of my colleagues use it too in, in our hospital. So how, how you do that is essentially you first, when you admit the patient, once you're dis deciding to hospitalize them, one of the lab markers you should get essentially with the other inflammatory markers is a D-dimer, which we talked about. So um, if the D-dimer is less than three, remember three was one of the uh, cutoff numbers, generally you just want to prophylaxis them with the regular low molecular weight heparin dosing, low inoxif or inoxaparin of 40 milligrams daily. And then every two days that the patient is hospitalized, you can monitor their D-dimer levels to see if it becomes greater than three. If it becomes greater than three or they're admitted and it's already three, one thing you as a clinician, if the opportunity is available, you can do point of care ultrasound, POCUS, P-O-C-U-S, point of care ultrasound. Um, if, if that modality is not available, you can always have, um, um, have it ordered by some, um, either a different technician or another specialty to do it for you. So more and more, we, in the internal medicine trainings we are having in the US, the residents are given um, bedside ultrasound training just to detect basic things. And one of them, one of those basic things is the blood clot. So when you do the point of care ultrasound and you see an obvious blood clots, then that gives you a very good indication to start someone on full dose anticoagulation, uh, starting them on an IV heparin drip. Um, but if that is negative, meaning you don't see a blood clots, that gives you justification to do something called a high intensity prophylaxis. Um, so that's different from just the 40 milligrams a daily dosing for normal patients that you would do. So this is what it looks like. So there's three categories. Category one is the patient who has a D-dimer of less than three, and they receive the standard prophylaxis of inoxaparin 40 milligrams daily. Um, and then category three right here on the right side, you detect a clot and you completely uh, dose them with full dose anticoagulation. What's unique about this model is category two. So here again, you have a D-dimer of greater than three, but on a POCUS exam, a point of care ultrasound exam, you notice that they don't have a clot, but their D-dimer is greater than three. Because it's greater than three, you have some justification that they are a little more high risk than normal patients who get blood clots. And you can do what's called high intensity prophylaxis, where instead of daily dosing of 40 milligrams, you do BID dosing every 12 hours. Um, so that's what's unique about this strategy, uh, the high intensity prophylaxis. Um, this is uh, something I wanted to share with you guys um, about a, a pick, one of the examples of a point of care ultrasound. This is another frequent finding you can often see on um, patients who tend to be coagulopathic or uh, in much more chance of getting coagulopathic. Here on this point of care ultrasound, what you're seeing is on FA is femoral artery, FV is femoral vein, and this is um, leading into the, or the saphenous vein leading into these. So here um, in the short axis view, what you're seeing is these three venous structures. And um, what you're seeing in this, femoral vein is this little haziness that you're not seeing in this artery. Now, when the uh, person doing the ultrasound, when they're compressing the vein, they're able to fully compress it, which shows that there's no clot. However, what this haziness that you're seeing compared to the artery is, this is something called a, quote, slow venous flow state. 
what that means is that this state, in this state, someone is very highly um, likely of developing a DVT. The patient does not have a DVT at this point, but he's very high risk. In fact, 80% of the people who have some um, this kind of slow venous flow state tend to develop DVT. So that's one thing you can learn when you're doing a bedside ultrasound um, that um, you can check for, especially on your rounds, if you have time at least, um, that this patient is high risk for developing clots and anticoagulation should be on the table. This is another picture, um, again, another short axis view of the femoral vein, which is on the center right here and the femoral artery, um, which is right here on the bottom right, and the site of the saphenous vein inflow, which is right here on the top right. And the swirling pattern that you're seeing in the vein, the femoral vein, it's a pattern of high, um, a high echogenicity that, you're, that suggests that, it, again, it's a low flow venous state. Um, so now we move on to the treatments. So this, the, the title of the slide really should be hydroxychloroquine. Um, now, the, I don't wanna to dwell too much on this because right now we're not using it, but the main um, interest in hydroxychloroquine initially started uh, with that French study uh, by that physician named Dr. Rolt. So in his study, he combined uh, hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin and Essentially, the study showed that there's some promising benefits of uh, using hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19 patients. If you look at the mechanism uh, from the previous slide, which let me see if I can pull up. Um, yeah, if you can see from the, the main um, role that hydroxychloroquine was supposed to do, it, it prevents endocytosis of the viral particles into the cell. Um, now, what, what the problem, um, starting out with that, is that... Um, once you have the virus, first of all, um, and you have viral entry, you have cytokine storm, it's already a little bit too late, number one, to, to be using hydroxychloroquine. Um, so there's a, first of all, there's a limited benefit just by knowing the pathophysiology of what hydroxychloroquine is doing. Um, so that, so in, again, the French study said it was good. Then later on, a VA study came, which showed, uh, which studied about thousand patients. And what it was showing was that patients actually had unfavorable outcomes um, in, COVID, uh, in using hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19. Um, both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin combined um, tended, uh, tends to increase uh, QT intervals and which causes higher risk for arrhythmias. Then, then another study came out, the Henry Ford trial, which said that there might be some, again, some benefit for using hydroxychloroquine. But when you looked at the data back at the Henry Ford trial, what it showed was that um, a lot of the data that we had, it, the patients actually who did well, they were actually on steroids, which then had the discussion, is steroids maybe beneficial for the COVID patients more than the hydroxychloroquine itself? So which, um, so then we know that treatment may not be the best, hydroxychloroquine may not be the best for treatment as far as treatment is concerned. But what about prophylaxis? Um, as far as we know, the latest study so far says prophylaxis also, there's no role for hydroxychloroquine. There's an article that I found on New England Journal. Let me see if I can find it. So 
um, essentially the conclusion of this article, um, which was dated on August 6th, so fairly recent, was that they exposed these patients on hydroxychloroquine. They um, gave hydroxychloroquine patients who were exposed to the COVID virus, and they assessed how likely they're um, to get infections uh, based on getting hydroxychloroquine or not. So essentially what they found is that this randomized trial did not demonstrate a significant benefit of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19. So once you get exposed to COVID-19, um, taking hydroxychloroquine to prevent the disease is not a good strategy is what the study was showing. So again, there's really right now no exposure. There's no role for prophylaxis as far as we know. Um, so what about steroids? So initial guidance uh, when COVID-19 first came out, it said steroids can, can be more harmful. And the reason why the initial guidance said that is because the, what, what we had best data to compare uh, COVID-19 on is with the other viruses, uh, like the MERS and the, the original SARS virus. So in both those um, viral studies, the data showed that there can be no benefit or sometimes even potential harm in using steroids to fight, fight those diseases. So naturally, people assumed that could be the same case with COVID-19. But unique to COVID-19, more and more new data is showing that steroids can be beneficial. Um, so it initially started from a no to yes, uh, to maybe, and now a yes, um, as far as standard treatment goes. So decadron seems to, or dexamethasone seems to be the um, choice for steroids versus other types. It can be potentially because compared to other um, um, glucocorticoids, dexamethasone tends to have less mineralocorticoid effect or activity. And what that does is um, it limits sodium and fluid retention. So remember what we said about um, dry lungs or happy lungs. So people tend to have retain less fluid um, with using decadron, dexamethasone versus um, let's say prednisone or solumedrol, methylprednisone. The main evidence we have for using um, steroids right now is from the recovery trial. So this was a um, RCT trial done in UK and Decadron of a dose of six milligrams was given to patients for 10 days. Um, so the, when, when this dose was given, when control, when uh, compared to the control group, what they should, uh, showed was that there's a 28 day mortality reduction um, in COVID-19 hospitalized patients. And uh, what the study also showed was the patients who benefited most from dexamethasone was patients who were on oxygen. So in other words, if someone is um, coming in with, has flu-like symptoms, they have COVID-19 and they don't require oxygen, Steroids may not be the best uh, treatment for them. They can, they should just do symptomatic management. But if you're hospitalizing them, you're having to give them nasal cannula or high flow nasal cannula or any kind of oxygen mental oxygen modality, um, all the way to mechanical ventilation. There's some roles for steroids in those patients. Um, it so it reduced mortality. It reduced hospital stay duration, and it even, in those who are on just high, uh, high flow or nasal cannula, it reduced the um, progression of needing mechanical ventilation. So multiple on multiple um, data points, we're seeing that steroids are pretty beneficial. On top of being beneficial, there's also objective lab markers people were seeing that uh, steroids were doing. So markers of inflammation like CRP, ferritin, LDH, and markers of coagulation like D-dimer, they tend to be actually going uh, in, in the downward direction once patients are started on steroids. So all in all, on paper and in clinic, uh, and in um, like a 
clinical outcomes or clinical symptoms, patients were improving on steroids. So steroids, uh, a big yes so far. The um, other treatment considerations we, we use in our hospital and actually in hospitals all over is remdesivir. So remdesivir was given um, emergency FDA use actually on April 30th here in the US. And remdesivir, essentially what it does is it inhibits viral replication. So it, it's an inhibitor of the viral RNA dependent um, polymerase. So how it even came about as a um, target was that it had some activity um, against the MERS and the original SARS virus. So naturally people were curious to see if it had same level of activity in uh, COVID-19. The, um, the suggested dose, if you do use remdesivir is 200 milligrams IV on day one, and then day two onwards, you do 100 milligrams daily for five days. Um, you may extend it, this dose up to 10 days, depending on their symptom improvement and um, patients may benefit from these extra daily dosings. Generally, you want to avoid those um, who have some kind of um, liver, already some liver injury, um, and you want to also look out for liver injury. In fact, once you start the dose, what the uh, manufacturer says is that if you have an ALT level greater than five times upper limit of normal that develops with the course, you want to essentially stop treatment of remdesivir. Um, it, there's, they also recommend uh, caution in patients with kidney disease, uh, whether it's from acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. Reason why, reason may not be directly from the remdesivir, but the way dem remdesivir is um, prepared, it's done in this cyclodextrin vehicle. And this cyclodextrin molecule, it actually accumulates quite a bit in renal impairment. So this part can be toxic. So Generally, there's the caution that you, you want to avoid remdesivir if anyone who has a GFR, uh, glomerular filtration rate, less than 30. The majority of the data we have um, for remdesivir is um, from this trial called the ACTT trial, which stands for Adaptive COVID-19 um, Treatment Trial. So in this trial, um, um, you had essentially 60 trial sites from 10 different countries, US, UK, Germany, Greece, Korea, Mexico, Spain, etc. So 10 different countries. And a total of 1,063 patients uh, was involved in the studies. And they split these, um, these per, um, parameters, um, age. The main group of people in the study was about, main age of uh, people in this group was about 58 looks like majority of them were men, 64% were men. And then this breaks down the ethnicities of the people in studies. Majority seems like it was white, 53% was white and only 12% uh, were Asians. Um, and the results of these outcomes were plotted in these graphs called, these are called Kaplan-Meier um, graphs of recoveries. So focus first on this graph A, which is on the top left. So for, uh, just right off the top, what you can see is that remdesivir has some level of um, increased population that recovered who got remdesivir compared to placebo uh, on COVID, with COVID-19. Um, they had a shorter time to recovery, 11 days versus 15 days for uh, people on the remdesivir group. Now, um, if you look at these individual points, so on B, the graph looks at patients receiving, um, not receiving oxygen. C is patients receiving oxygen. So in both these, you see a clear benefit in remdesivir over placebo. So whether someone gets oxygen or not, remember this is different from steroids, decadron, which only benefits people who are on oxygen. Here, whether you're getting oxygen or not, there's a benefit in remde getting remdesivir um, as far as symptom severity and recovery of the disease goes. Um, what you start to see essentially is a not so beneficial effect or a mixed effect in patients requiring 
a lot of oxygen um, defined as either a high flow oxygen or non-invasive mechanical ventilation like BiPAP. And same thing that you see also on patients who are mechanically ventilated. You don't see much of that benefit um, of getting remdesivir. And this makes sense uh, more or less mechanistically, because if you remember what remdesivir is doing is that um, it's preventing viral replication, correct? So arguably, if someone is requiring a lot of oxygen, whether it's non-invasive mechanical ventilation or mechanical ventilation, they are in a stage of the disease where a lot of the viral particles actually have invaded a lot of the cells, and there's a whole bunch of cytokine storm. Um, and it's probably a little too late to mitigate um, the replication cycle at that point. So the argument for remdesivir fails in those require those who are essentially very severe COVID, not just severe COVID, enough to require um, non-invasive ventilation and mechanical ventilation. So again, going back, steroids or glucocorticoids beneficial in patients on oxygen, no matter what type, um, high flow, nasal cannula, or mechanical ventilation, whereas remdesivir is only beneficial in patients either not getting oxygen or getting just regular nasal cannula oxygen. Um, what about convalescent plasma? I didn't want to dwell too much onto this because right now, as far as we know at this point, there's no good um, uh, RCT trials showing that there's uh, convalescent plasma is beneficial. In theory, it should be beneficial because what you're doing is you're taking plasma from recovered patients, which has the antibodies that they've used to fight the COVID with, and then transfusing them into patients who have active disease. But um, as of now, even though mechanistically it makes sense, no good trial shows any benefit. And in fact, one of the latest RCT trials we have right now, let me see if I can pull that up. So the latest trial we have here is from June 3rd, 2020. Um, it shows that the title is Effect of Convalescent Plasma on Time to Clinical Improvement in Patients with Severe and Life-Threatening COVID. So the bottom line it shows is that among patients with severe or life-threatening COVID, convalescent plasma added to standard treatment compared to standard treatment alone did not result in any statistical improvement in time to clinical improvement. So we don't have any RCT trials proving its benefit. And the only one we have, a small one, is showing that it's not beneficial. So not a great tool at this point. So no point in um, dwelling on it right now. OK, so that's the um, main therapeutics we use in our hospital in a nutshell, because that's the most evidence-based. There's a lot of other things a lot of new antivirals in, um, in circulation that are developing um, and a lot of other treatment strategies, but this is the most evidence we have and that's what we're commonly using as of now. Now, based on this lecture, I had a few, um, couple of quiz questions that um, you can participate in if you're interested. So the first one um, is this. So we have a 65-year-old man with diabetes high cholesterol, and heart disease, who's admitted to the um, ICU, the medical ICU, with severe respiratory failure due to COVID. Um, he requires mechanical ventilation. What lab findings are most characteristic of COVID-19 induced coagulopathy and poor prognosis early on in the course of infection? Does anyone want to participate? Dear participants, please do unmute and participate in this quiz. It's a unique opportunity to uh, talk to our international speaker. We should be interacting. Please do unmute and try to answer the questions. Okay? B. B. 
B. Okay, anyone have any different? Option B. Okay, D, D as in dog. So, um, yeah, so elevated D dimer, R, you can you can narrow it down to B and D. So we talked about D dimer being a very poor prognostic factor. In fact, high levels of D dimer greater than three, you should receive higher dose prophylaxis is what we're saying. Um, and what I also said was generally the other markers of coagulopathy are usually not very deranged. But if it is deranged, like fibrin normal being high, that actually tends to even worse prognosis. So any kind of inflammatory markers like CRP, ferritin being high is a bad prognosis. Any kind of coagulation markers being high, whether it's D-dimer, fibrinogen, uh, INR, PTT, that also indicates a bad prognosis. There are certain end organ indices like um, signs of AKI, like high um, reduced GFR, high creatinine, or elevated urea, elevated AST, elevated LDH, all these are bad markers. On a CBC, if you look, remember, um, increased WBC, so leukocytosis, and decreased lymphocytes, so lymphopenia, are uh, bad markers. Um, okay, so moving on. Now, it's another coagulation question. So 35-year-old woman with no medical history presented with three days of fever and shortness of breath. She's hypoxic, requires two liters of oxygen to maintain an oxygen saturation above 90%. So first of all, is this severe COVID? Yes or no? I will take any response. Yes, we are waiting for a response. Dear friends. Um, I like the yes part. So we'll go with yes. Um, Later, come see. Yeah, we are getting uh, quite a few answers from us, our delegates. And most of them are giving the answer as yes. Okay. Um, so yes, it's a severe COVID. So um, chest shows diffuse bilateral infiltrates. PCR shows po positive for COVID. Patients admitted to the nursing floor and started on antibiotics, steroids, and remdesivir. Um, complete metabolic panel and blood counts are normal. What is the most appropriate strategy for DVT prophylaxis in this patient or VTE prophylaxis in the patient? Uh, Avinash? Yes. People are answering through the chat box. So you can look into the answers in the chat box also. Oh, okay. One second. Um, it's down below on the tab. You have uh, just to the left of the share screen part, there's something called chat, right? Okay. Um, yeah. I'll, okay. I'll just take people's word for it. So the answer is um, uh, enoxaparin 40 milligrams daily. So again, um, someone sh should be on some kind of chemo prophylaxis always um, when someone is admitted for COVID-19. Um, in fact, the literature says that even when there's the only absolute contraindication is if someone has a very low platelet count of less than 25,000. Um, now, if this question was to say, was to give you that this patient had a D dimer of greater than three, then the answer would change to 40 milligrams twice daily. Because remember, again, this patient would benefit from high intensity prophylaxis. And if you do an ultrasound, a, a point of care ultrasound, and you find a clot, then you can anticoagulate them fully. Generally, um, again, because of multiple reasons, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, and anticoagulant, you want to uh, go with heparin versus other anticoagulation. Pixaban is not a good choice because, again, we don't at, like heparin, doesn't have the other properties. And on top of that, it can um, interact with remdesivir. It can have drug interactions. So 
generally not a good choice right now. Um, okay, which of the following has been recognized as a significant risk factor for the development of ARDS and death in patients in COVID-19? Again, this is showing like what's a poor prognostic factor. So remember the rule what we said was um, anything that shows high inflammatory markers or a high thrombotic state or certain lab markers is a bad sign. So again, the only thing that points to all, um, all of those is an elevated D-dimer. Good. Uh, I think Gokul Suresh tried to answer that. That's good for Gokul Suresh. He gets bonus points. Um, uh, we've got answers from uh, Fasna Sharin, Mahika, Suman, Malavika, Angel. All of them have uh, come up with the answer as B. So they've got it spot on. Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah. I think all of them deserve bonus points on the next test, wherever that's going to be. Absolutely. We'll work on that. Okay. And let's go with last one. Which of the following most accurately reflects the estimated incubation period of COVID-19? And this I briefly talked about, but did anyone have an idea? So again, 99% um, of the cases uh, happen in less than 14 days. Out of those, the mean um, period that people manifest from exposure is about four to five days. So the only answer we can possibly do with that is C, which is two days to two weeks. Yeah, so we've got answers from Archa, Medha, Fasna, Malavika, Navneet, Mahika, Tara Kurian, uh, Suman, Rose Anne, and Shalu Raji. So all have come up with the answer as C. Okay, excellent. So, so it C should is... be raining bonus points. Okay, we will we will need to make these write these names down later so we can we can yeah. assign those. Absolutely. Uh, and let's see one more. Um, which of the following statements is most accurate about the differences between SARS, the original SARS virus, and COVID nineteen? So A, SARS has a higher risk of transmission before the development of severe illness. B, COVID-19 has a higher prevalence of severe illness in SARS. Asymptomatic transmission is possible with SARS, unlike COVID-19. The case fatality rate associated with SARS is higher than the case fatality rate associated with COVID-19, shown in early reports. Any ideas? Excellent. So yes, actually someone is marking my slide and they're saying D as the answer. Um, and that is right. So right now we don't have the full numbers, uh, but the estimate is that it is definitely less than 2% as far as mortality goes uh, for COVID-19. The, um, the more accurate numbers say that actually it's, it might be even less than 1%. If you compare that to the original SARS virus, the fatality rate actually was about 10 to 11%. So 10 to 11% of the people who got SARS died. And for the MERS virus, Middle East, um, the Middle East virus, the number was about 4%. Um, so compared to those two, the, the one to 2% that we're seeing is gonna be much less as far as case fatality goes. And that's pretty much it. Sorry, it took so long. I didn't realize it's over an hour, but I hope you guys learned something from it. Wow. Thank you, Avinash. That, yeah, was, uh, you. that was an extra vaganza. Um, yeah, yeah. It was really good. Thank you so much. Over to Dr. S.K. Matthew, sir, for moderation. Yeah, thank you, Avnash, for that uh, lucid presentation on COVID-19 and the current therapies. And you had put everything very clearly, starting from the uh, viral, uh, 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 basic virology, the replication, the symptoms, and the symptom that anosmia is mostly OP was a good point. And then you came down to the, uh, uh, um, the lab settings, the testing, and then, of course, you focused on the respiratory and coagulopathy uh, uh, 
in particular. And respiratory, you really uh, insisted on looking at the ABG and also um, and looking at the plateau pressure and maintaining the uh, uh, peep, adequate PEEP to protect the lung. These are all important points for the intensivists who manage COVID and also uh, to hang on to oxygen and NAV and do not delay ventilation. That was your key point. And then when you came to uh, coagulopathy, uh, the point was that uh, uh, the uh, heparin doses uh, might be, you'll be needing more uh, heparin in COVID was an important point which should be remembered. And also uh, the point of care ultrasound uh, was an important point, uh, point for us. And, uh, and coming to other therapeutic uh, measures like remdesivir, which you are currently using, one question which I wanted to raise was that, can we use um, remdesivir again as when it, uh, after uh, giving for a once? Can we repeat it? That's one question which you would like to answer. And uh, as a whole, you did very well. And the question and the question part of it, uh, the queries part of it was excellent. And you made all the students to take part in this. And I'm really happy about it. I'm waiting for your comment. Sure. Oh, and th thanks for those positive feedback. And the answer is yes. So while it, um, wh wh while you have a current course of treatment, um, so the set guideline says up to 10 days is what remdesivir is beneficial for. So if someone has, let's say, a reinfection, meaning like they got COVID, recovered, and then two months later, they have a new COVID infection, remdesivir would be beneficial at that point. But you're probably asking on the same course of infection, let's say they have an infection for 10 days, on the 11th day, they're still somewhat infectious. The answer is yes, there is a clinical, uh, clinician guided um, consensus that you can continue that treatment a little indefinitely. And again, you need to base that treatment based on the side effects. So talking about liver and kidney injury, you need to monitor for those two things as you choose to continue uh, treatment. Yeah, one of the audience that come with a question that uh, about their experiences with ECMO in ARDS. Yeah. So, yeah, so generally ECMO is practiced in high um, volume centers. So once you have maximally done what you can on mechan regular mechanical ventilation, ECMO would be the um, right go-to as far as um, maintaining hemodynamic stability and oxygenation goes. But um, the, the experience we have in ECMO is very limited in our hospital. But the data that shows with ECMO is that just like with mechanical ventilation, once you're on it, the prognosis is not very good. So the number for mechanical ventilation is about 49% of people who are in mechanical ventilation don't make it. The numbers on ECMO are actually a little more higher. Um, it tends to be around 60, 62% of people who are who get ECMO, who end up getting ECMO, um, don't do well. But that being said, if that's a that's available in your facility and that's the only thing you can you are left to try, um, it's definitely something worth trying. Yeah, that's an important point for ECMO. And here in Believers Church Medical College Hospital we admit and treat people, uh, patients with severe systemic illness, who, uh, those who happy to contract COVID. Uh, so here we, ca uh, we have CKD patients, CLD patients, heart patients and all that. Uh, what will be your strategy for CKD? Is there any, anything special? We can't give remdesivir. We can't give um, uh, other measures. Even uh, uh, this heparin might be limited of limited use in CL, uh, uh, CLD patients. Um, limited use in CKD patients? Yeah, no, see, uh, uh, chronic liver disease patients. Oh, their, right. Um, uh, their INR will be high and then. Uh, right, yeah. So you can, um, there's a couple of points on that. Yeah, you don't, you still have steroids and oxygen. That's going to be the most beneficial treatment as far as um, what we have so, for, so far. The other thing with heparin is that, so, just because you have liver disease or kidney disease, it doesn't preclude you from getting an anticoagulation if you need. And what you essentially do is that our pharmacists here renally dose it. Um, so the heparin drip protocols we have here are based on 10A levels. So how much heparin 
someone gets every two or three hours um, depends on the, the 10A levels that the patient has. Um, but yes, you're right. So when you, when you have those kind of liver and kidney problems, the, the other drugs, the antivirals that you have on your toolbox tends to be limited. Dr. Sunil has asked a question about uh, how useful is Postiltamivir in treatment of COVID-19? But I think- How useful is uh, what? Postiltamivir. Oh, Tamiflu, uh, not very useful. So uh, people have tried using Tamiflu, Oseltamivir um, with, with COVID and what they found is it, it's, um, you don't have the same viral entry or replication um, process with coronavirus and the flu virus, influenza virus. So it, it's not very beneficial is the answer. Yeah, uh, any more questions from the audience? And if you remember also oseltamivir, Tamiflu, what, what it's doing is it's not treating the flu. What all it's doing is reducing the duration. So let's say someone gets the flu and it lasts seven days. What Tamiflu or oseltamivir does is it changes that seven days into five days. So you're just reducing symptom or uh, duration of the disease, theoretically. Um, any more questions? If not, I think, oh yeah, we have one more question from uh, Sunil Matthew. Um, uh -huh. What about post-COVID recovery problems, Avinash? Um, what are the problems that you commonly encounter and how do you handle it? Can you please throw some light on that? Um, yeah, so the Post-COVID recovery from the ICU side and medicine side is going to be different. So anything that you can imagine from the ICU side with any ICU case you'll have with COVID, um, that involves like post-critical care myopathy, um, that involves ICU delirium. On the medicine side, um, the, the best examples that you can see is actually in the most healthiest people. So um, we've had high school and college athletes who develop COVID, majority of them do well, but a few, a fraction, maybe like 10 to 15%, you see that they start to have decreased exercise capacity or tolerance in the first few months after they recover from COVID. And generally this pathophysiology um, is because of um, cardiac involvement. So when you have, um, which, we, which we did not talk about on our slide, so when you have this severe disease, again, you have these inflammatory cytokines um, and you have these deposition of viral molecules um, all over the body. Um, so when you have, um, after the COVID virus, if you have some kind of heart involvement, it could be anything. It could be in the extreme cases, you can have MI. In the lower cases, you might have some kind of small Form, uh, various form of either pericarditis or myocarditis, or some might even be subclinical injury to the heart. Um, essentially what you're seeing is that they have these um, lower exercise tolerance because of their heart and muscle involvement. Um, this disease just has not been long enough to know what the 10 or 20 year outcome is gonna be, uh, but um, what we have seen more and more is that two to three months, these prime peaked athletes, they tend to be uh, less of in their performance shape than they're used to. The reason why we look at these prime athletes is because they are the peak examples of what a patient, I guess, ideally should be and what a disease can do to someone who's in their prime. You can expect somewhat um, of an increased thing in, um, in a normal regular set of patients. So yes, there is some level of uh, post-COVID um, um, body damage that the that patients can have. Um, up to what level, we don't know fully because it's just not been there long enough. Yeah, one of the delegates has come with a question. What is the cause of anosmia in COVID patients? Um, 
100% not sure, but um, the same, remember the ACE2 enzyme, um, the receptor that the virus enters through, the same receptors are supposedly present in, um, in your olfactory uh, neurons. So the, that is the best understood guess at this point. The chimp vaccine, how useful it is? That is one question that came up at the end. Sorry, the what vaccine? The chimp vaccine. The AstraZeneca chimp vaccine. Have you heard um, of it? Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, but if um, there's, there's five, actually five total vaccine trials right now, um, five total vaccine candidates, I should say. And no, I'm not familiar with the chimp one. So can we follow a patient with serial CRP levels in a um, asymptomatic patient just to check if the patient may go for problems? That is, if we, we check the patient CRP levels, uh, will he be uh, will he be following up? Um, yeah, you, theoretically you can, but um, if someone is asymptomatic, I would generally not recommend doing any lab tests, um, just because you you when you always look for problems, you will find unnecessary problems. Um, so if someone is asymptomatic, generally the thought process is don't do any further lab testing, let the disease run its course. The, this, uh, the testing itself will cause a lot of anxiety and uh, right. problems. So always we go by the symptoms and also mm -hmm. the uh, basic lab tests. Okay. And um, I mean, what I want to also remind people is that make sure you use CRP with, um, or any kind of lab inflammatory marker with a grain of salt, because the, inflama the inflammation markers are not just elevated in COVID. So if someone has something else going on, whether they have a rheumatologic disease, whether they have any other side infections, uh, keep that in mind also as, uh, uh, as you look at CRP. There was one query on the role of ivermectin. Yeah, so ivermectin became a top candidate or one of the top candidates in around um, April, May season. Um, it's an anti-helminthic um, medicine. Uh, the No major study has shown any benefit as of now. So it's generally not used in any hospitals in, in the US. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Avinash Alexander, for your excellent presentation and a cool one. And you answered all the questions and also uh, uh, threw light into a lo uh, lot of aspects. And uh, I think uh, it was very useful for us, uh, for us and our students in uh, VCMCH. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. So um, we come to an end of our webinar. Thank you, Avinash. You've taken time out of your busy schedule. We know that you're a very busy hospitalist, uh, actively taking care of your critically ill patients and you took the time and you prepared such a wonderful presentation for us. We are indebted for that. And I'm already re receiving quite a few messages from students and friends to rope you in for further talks, you know, on different uh, topics. So I hope you're game for that and, um, yeah, so extremely grateful for that, Avinash. Truly appreciate it. And uh, SK Matthew, sir, uh, with all your experience and wonderful expertise, thank you so much for pitching in to, uh, to moderate this session and uh, your presence has been truly uh, precious for us. Thank you so much, dear thank sir. You. Thank you so much. And I would also like to thank all our delegates present, our precious uh, medical students, our teachers, our uh, all our uh, doctors and delegates from all over Kerala and beyond, international delegates. And thank you so much for uh, attending this uh, webinar. Meet you with one more webinar soon. Uh, so signing off uh, from Believers Church Medical College. Thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate it.